Greetings, good people, and welcome back to the show where we sit down with rad people who are doing rad things. Today is a twofer. That's right, we have two guests as a one package deal. And we're going to be talking about how they got into podcasting themselves, how I cut wood like Arnold Schwarzenegger from Commando, and a brand new segment that I'm looking forward to unveiling. So let's get straight into things. But before we do, my name is Dread. And this is Three Poor Bastards with Kyle and Eric from the Paradise Arcade. This is Wave Shaper. Hey, this is Megan McDuffie. This is Megan with Andy Set. Uh, hey, what's up? This is Ghost. This is Joy Bishop. Hello, this is Dan Terminus, and you're listening to the Paradise Arcade. I'll be bros. Clear your throat. Clear my throat. That's when ah. I'm about to start. And then I get all nervous because I'm about to start when we've been going the whole time. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the show, everyone. And please join me in welcoming Kyle and Eric of the Paradise Arcade. Thank you both for being here with me today. I appreciate it. I know you guys are super busy. You had a lot going on this weekend, especially. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Sit down. And- of course shooting the shit no problemo yeah thanks for having us it's it's a weird format being on video so i don't know what to do with my hands or my head or my body right now clap (laughs) just constantly clap that's what we do with our hands i was listening to your guys' show two poor bastards which is i believe your first ever endeavor into podcasting yeah many years ago What was it like starting that? When did you start that? Actually, I was trying to find a date. I couldn't see a date of when the first episode came out. I, you know, I was thinking about that um, before I came over here. I believe it was like May or June of 2018, I believe. Okay. I was going to guess 2018. Yes, 2018. Um, And it was that first episode was fuck around and find out. That was literally what it was. That's the best kind of podcasting. Two dudes yeah. sitting down, shooting the shit, and figuring out what works. Yeah. It was really long. It was long. It was the, like a four-hour episode. <laughs> we ended up recording for four and a half hours, yeah. and we got really, really drunk. And uh, it took me, I think, maybe almost a month to edit it, because <laughs> uh, th- I think the final episode length is might be two or two and a half hours, I think. Yeah, it's two and a half and, hours. And uh, so said. I had to cut out another two hours of content to get it down to be even remotely coherent. There's so much cutting in that. Like I'm, I'm surprised it's even remotely like. Is it coherent? I, I, I that's a good question at this point. Okay. Yeah. yeah no, you guys it, were talking about Leviathan. It was fairly chronological yeah. the way through, and it was good. I actually haven't seen Leviathan, so I was enjoying it. It, it was a good documentary. I yeah. mean, other than the, like, uh, what I remember is that the, it was the overly self-congratulatory, like, yeah. everyone really loved each other. <laughs> yeah, you guys were mentioning a lot of dick sucking. Yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about that, right. It might yeah. not have been related to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's hard to say. Oh, man. Yeah, no, that, it's it's really enjoyable. And I I was actually really surprised for, a first ever podcast that it was as good as it was. And and the premise of it is basically you guys sitting down had a highlight whiskey and you would talk about pop culture and drink copious or maybe not amounts of that whiskey and talk about yeah. the, t- the tasting of the whiskey and also about the pop culture topic of the day. Which one of you was more of the whiskey connoisseur to start? Were you both into whiskey? That's you, Kyle. That 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 was me, and I've Eric's now mad at me for getting him into <laughs> yeah. it. I, I actually yelled at him last, last night. night. Yeah, yeah, about it. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Things have changed. <laughs> there there used to be many many good uh, varieties, somewhat available. Oh. Back then, but that was like the starting 
point of the decline. And whiskey clubs and the ability to get good stuff. Oh, okay. And, uh, and he got me into it at like the very tail end of the availability of anything. And now you can't get swill for sixty dollars. Oh, really? I'm it's not even... about spending a lot, a lot of money. I don't want to spend a lot of money on whiskey. That's not like yeah. I'm not snooty like that. I want just a decent drinkable whiskey for a decent price, and you can't get that anymore. I might. Uh... Want to... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, once upon a time, like the stuff that I would be like, eh, this is acceptable. This is like bottom shelf stuff, but I can deal with it is now stuff that you got to know someone to get. They raffle it off. Yeah. Save no it for special way. occasions. You yeah. just can't, they don't put it on the shelf anymore, let alone the bottom shelf. Has, like, is there a reason for that? What happened? Uh, the popularity increase just the supply not being there right more whatever widely is available produced. yeah like what what for bourbon at least what is you see on the shelf right now typically was originally made you know eight nine years ago right and eight nine years ago they didn't account for the huge explosion in popularity right whiskey has become yeah and okay it just I, takes time i actually didn't think of that and then just looking at my bottle here it's nine years so yeah that that's Makes a lot of sense. So now they're probably pumping out a lot. There's just a shit ton in barrels waiting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it won't be another eight, nine years until we see the benefit of any ramp up in production. I'm still curious what the the result of that will be because the you, he talks about the demand. There's also the like the shelf hoarders where they'll go in and just buy the entire like allotment that a liquor store has it just either bunkers it or tries to sell it oh wow and then you've got supply chain issues yeah. Yeah. you got all that shit um and plus bourbon takes time it takes yeah. time to get good it's always those the fucking flippers. assholes that they gotta do assholes. that hey there it's with everything and i've even seen it in in vinyl a lot too people oh yeah buying vinyl the, and fucking selling it for way more the discog so, scalpers there, for everything cool, there will always be a person who's in it just to make a profit. Mm -hmm. It's always about money. You mentioned a different podcast earlier that was kind of the thing that made you guys go, you know what, maybe we should do something like this. It was, it was called Wine and Crime? Yeah, so I am friends with um, a person in that podcast. And this was maybe 2017, and that that podcast had really started to take off and it's, it's huge now. It's a, it's a really big true crime podcast. And the, the person that's in that was like, you know, you should have your own show. And I'm like, I don't get it. I barely know what the internet is. So why <laughs> I didn't understand the allure. I just didn't understand podcasts. I didn't understand that entire thing. Right. And, uh, we still don't, we still don't, we really don't know what we're doing, but my, my technical background is I used to be a radio engineer. So the reason why it, it sounds and is able to be edited the way it is from the beginning is my background is in radio. Right. So, um, I ended up doing an engineering thing for a live show for them. And it finally dawned on me the connection that audiences have to the show. And I was like, Oh, I get it. I get it now. I get people. It, it's like you get to be in on a cool conversation with someone. You get to be. It, it feels like you're there. So at that, after that, I'm like trying to think of a show I could do. I had all the shit laying around. I was an electronic musician and again worked in radio. So right, I had the stuff laying around. I didn't have to buy anything. And I, the one person I thought of, I'm like, the, there's one person that has to be in on this, is Kyle. And it took me about three months to convince you to even sit down to do it. I'm still not convinced. Yeah, I know you're still not convinced. I should do that. And, uh, <laughs> and so the, and I knew, like, and I had to, like, think of, like, a way to manipulate him into doing it. So I'm like, well, what is Kyle like? <laughs> whiskey. Well, whiskey. <laughs> what is Kyle like? Fucking movies. So let's sit down and talk about some shit. And after four and a half hours and some whiskey, we, we had a, had a show and it kind of went from there that's awesome man that's a great start 
what was it like for you, Kyle, on the first episode? Were you still kind of like, eh, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about this, or were you enjoying it? Uh, I was enjoying it because we got considerably blasted on the whiskey <laughs> that we had. Yeah. So it, it almost felt like an argument <laughs> <laughs> of some sort about you know a movie that you really like. You know, totally. you can you can talk about it for hours, which we did. Yeah. yeah so literally. that that wasn't uh, yeah that wasn't so bad. Yeah, when I was just like, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say the the build up to it and planning it out and be like, oh, we're going to do this. It is just like, what is like literally what is a podcast? Yeah. Like, why does someone want to listen to my ass talk about something? And here we are. Here we are. <laughs> this is what we're doing. You are still doing it now with yeah. a different name, a little bit of a different format, but uh, yep, still at it. The format had to die because we couldn't keep. There's a few reasons. Number one, we couldn't keep drinking as much as we did. And the good whiskey ran out. And you can only tolerate drinking shitty whiskey for so long. And the problem is, is not only is it shitty whiskey, but it's also expensive. So yeah, all right. you end up with bottles that are, are really only good effectively as drain cleaner. And you're trying to like, like be- grin and bear through a tasting of something that's so awful. And you spent a lot of money on it. Right. We've definitely dumped some bottles. Yeah, literally. We made a drain cleaner. Fuck. So you guys went into getting electronic music producers on the show when you were doing Two Poor Bastards. From what I could yeah. see, North Innsbruck was your first guest that was an electronic yeah. music yes. producer. So the the whole show, the whole thing, um, was, was a, an experiment in motion. We were... F- trying stuff out, figuring out. So we started off just us, Jaw Jack, and figured out on our flow, yep. how we have a conversation, how to how it makes sense in the context of a recording. How do you keep track of a narrative? We didn't do very good because we're getting drunk the whole time, <laughs> but it still was the the practice of it. Then we're like, well, let's get some friends on. We'll, yeah. we'll talk to our friends. And so we started to like interview them and that, like, okay, this is going well. And then, Chris or North Innsbruck is the first per- stranger that we interviewed for the show. So, oh, so you didn't know him before thought... that? No. Oh, I wonder if he thought we were going to murder him. He did. He said he waited outside my house for like 20 minutes just scoping out the neighborhood <laughs> to see what was going on. <laughs> it's kind of a shitty neighborhood that you used to It's straight up as a ghetto. <laughs> That's so, probably why he uh, was scoping it out for so long. He's like, oh man, yeah, this is like, kind of suspect. Like, am I gonna get sh- <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get shot. Uh, so. That was the first leap, and we had we'd known about because um, we had talked about synthwave before on the show, I believe. Um, so we're like, well, let's try and find a musician of somebody, and and he was the local guy that we knew or that we got to know. Mm-hmm. But he was like, so I reached out to him and got him on the show, and and then that was the start of it. And really, it was that was the episode that people really started to respond to. It started to trickle through different social media um, channels and people started like comment and respond on it. And we were still doing the other stuff. And we just, anytime we had a synth wave artist on, that was the episode that did really well. So or just right. talked about it in general. Yeah. Talked about it in general. That's when people really responded. What's your guys' first introductions to synth wave. So at, at the same time, I was told by a friend who works at a record store. Um, I and another friend were listening to Poolside a lot. And I said, hey, you know, this is a cool artist. This album's really great. What else is there like this? And he's like, oh, if you like that, uh, there's much better stuff out there. You should check out Calm Trues, and you should check out Ghost. So Brad. I checked out In Decay. And ST, ST, and Skull, I think, were both out by that time. I listened to both of those, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Floodgates. What? What is? What is this? Right. Where has this been? Yeah. And my life has completely changed right now, and it's yeah. just been full force, ass, mouth, and vagina. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Ever since. Two hands and two holes. Yeah. You're ready to go. Fill them up. <laughs> yes. uh for me so 
uh, Kyle and I have been friends for a long time. And so whenever he's like getting into new shit, he's like, I just fucking heard this thing. You need to check, check this out. So like we got into like French touch at about the same time when drive came out. I remember like you need to fucking check this thing out. And I'm like, I did. And I'm like, I fell in love with French touch and Kavinsky and danger and justice yeah. and that whole thing. And, and I, after that, there really wasn't, I didn't really feel it. Like there was anything else going on. Right. And then a few years later, you know, Kyle again, thanks to you, you were like, you need to fucking check out some other shit. And Com Trues and like Wave Shaper and Perturbator and a few other things. And I started to do some research of like, well, who are the, who are the, th I'm hearing about this now. Who should I go check out? And so I listened to Com Trues's uh, Galactic Melt and I listened to Perturbator's uh, Dangerous Days and it like, it completely changed everything in my life i mean literally i think changed the course of our lives it was like the doing. meme pictures where it's like here's this character before synthwave yeah here's this character after literally synthwave. we were that it changed the entire course of everything that i was pursuing hobbies and interests and everything else went away and it became synthwave this whatever this genre of music is and eventually here we are on the show yep. basically with you is, is really how uh, massive and it's, you don't... touched on something uh, good too, you know, talking about the French stuff. Like we were both into electronic music yeah. years and years ago before getting into right. Synthwave, but, yeah. like, you know, and I was like big into all the Ed Banger artists at the time, yeah. Daft Punk and that kind of thing. Yep. And then you were into like the Aphex Twin yeah, and that IDM. kind of side yep. of it. So, it, it it was an awesome like discovery, but more of it was like a natural progression of like here's the things we like, here's this new ultimate form, this yeah. new thing. It it's the mega form. It's the ultimate form of the stuff. Because it was like I used to make electronic music and I always try to like make things like the things I wanted to hear, and I could never make it because I'm not very good. So when Com Trues and Perturbator came out, I thought that they were the perfect distillation of everything I'd ever wanted in music. Com right. Trues being one side, Perturbator being another side. Uh, like, and I was like, well, I'm never going to make music again because these two guys have made everything that I was trying to say, that I was trying to express. They did it. Here it is. This is what I wanted. Uh, and, and then I knew like, I had arrived to like, the thing of like, here's my home. Here's where we are at. Right. What was your guys' relationships like to music before that? Were you as into the genres of music you were listening to as you are into synthwave now? Or was synthwave just this genre I've that always... really changed your life? Or was music a very big part of your life before that as well? For me, music, I don't think, was such a big thing until probably after high school. Yep. It's like while I was in school... Um, I listened to a lot of hip hop. Like that was my thing while I was growing up. Right. It was most of what my friends listened to, what was readily available. And yep. I really, I really love nineties hip hop. Love it. Yep. I won't, I won't ever say otherwise. But, um, after that, I started getting more into metal. So I became like a big metal fan and, you know, I was getting really into all of the aspects with that. But, uh, and then along with that, too, at the same time, um, all like the French electronic artist was another thing, too. But yeah, once Synthwave hit, I was just like, wow, this is this is the thing that's really for me. Right. Mm -hmm. This is here. I, I'm home. Yeah. Totally. Here I am. Uh, for, for me, I've always been passionate about music. I come from a, a music household. I used to play instruments uh, growing up. And I would say since the age of like... 19 i've been involved in music in some way so i used to be a metal journalist and was huge in the metal scene and uh did a lot of stuff with metal record companies back in the early 2000s and uh, involved in some way um and kind of when synthwave hit was like my low point in music where i was thinking like well i don't understand modern music i don't understand where metal's going i don't understand like i was hoping like with the french touch like that would lead into something else right 
And it kind of fizzled out like Justice's second album was not great. And Danger wasn't releasing that much stuff. And Kudvinsky was kind of like, it was really like not a lot of stuff. And so I was waiting for like, well, where's where's the rest of the music? Where's the rest of this? Where's the cascade of this? And it never happened. It never picked up as a as a movement, in my opinion. And right. so I was kind of like, well, am I just going to be relegated to listening to Aphex Twin and Depeche Mode the rest of my life? Like, is that what? I mean, that wouldn't be terrible. It's not terrible. It's not a, it's not a <laughs> bad place to be. Uh, but then that hit, and then it was like, and then it re-energized everything. And I'm like, I, I need to absorb all of this music in every way possible into every fiber of my body. Right. I'm, a, I'm going to echo that. I was kind of like, as a decline, like nothing seems interesting. Yep. I don't like contemporary pop music. That's not for me. And yep. then, boom, there it was. Yep. That's pretty similar for me, actually. I felt like it was the low point of my musical enjoyment when I found Synthwave as well. I was big into punk rock in my younger years. When I was like 16, I had a fucking foot-long Liberty Spikes. Massive. Nice. Oh, yeah. I was. I loved like British punk, Ramones, Sex Pistols, Clash, all that type of shit. Where's, where's the hair now, buddy? I'm, I'm balding, dude. Like, uh, this isn't by choice. This is not by choice. I lost the top. I thought you just wanted to be sexy. I could, oh, <laughs> I could have, like, uh, just the back of my head Liberty Spikes. Can you be, have a skullet? Oh, yeah. That, that'd, be, that'd be great. I thought of the, it. The you side, know. side mohawks? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just the old dude that won't let go of the previous hair. and You could be like Keith Flint. Okay, retro Keith Flint <laughs> Firestarter music video with the mohawks on the sides of the head. Yep. I was thinking of just going, for, like, I like your idea, the skullet. Go for the Hulk Hogan. I mean, he was big and tough and badass, and he was rocking a skullet. No one would ever say anything about that. I'm, I'm thinking Devin Townsend when he was in <laughs> his band. That was, uh, you know, that was quite the impressive skullet. I just don't know if I can pull it off. I mean, I might mm. have to adjust the mustache a bit if I'm rocking a skullet. You'd have to adjust the mustache up. Yeah, the twirl. Yeah, with a skullet. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't think any changes need to be no, made. No, not really. You never know yep. unless you try. <laughs> hey, I Man. need you to spend the next three years growing your hair back out. I was gonna say for this experiment, a skullet is a large commitment because my hair needs to be fucking long to get there. So yeah. I, I either need to wear just a hat permanently for three years until my hair is long enough to be a skullet. You know those people when they take their hats off and it's like they're so bald, there's no hair at all on the top of their head? And it's like the Austin Powers moment when he sees the mole and he's like, whoa! Yeah, that's, that's, that's me. I, every time I get a new hat, I just glue the fake hair to the new hat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And, like Gallagher. Uh, yeah. And here I am. Here you are. So it after, doesn't really actually have that much hair. No, or it's, it's just a nice wig. <laughs> i would call it nice it's, but it, it's a nice weave <laughs> yeah <laughs> the the beard and mustache are also fake yes i drew those on real quick <laughs> <laughs> after punk for me i i kind of had brushes with synth as a whole mm. um i had the not i wasn't really into electronic music after punk rock i kind of I didn't really know where to go. I was the same kind of thing. I didn't really know. I wasn't a fan of contemporary pop. I didn't really know what was there. And I heard Justice in a ski movie, but it, that was it. I just heard the, the song Genesis. And I was like, this is fucking sick. And it was in a ski movie, but I didn't, I didn't actually explore after that. And then I heard Mega Drive somewhere. I don't remember where I heard it, but... I was blown away by like acid spit and converter and reducer of, of mega drive. Those tracks totally blew my mind, but again, it didn't lead to me discovering anything outside of that. I just thought this is fucking rad, but that was it. I didn't experience anything outside of that. And then I got heavy into metal lamb of God, kill switch engage shit like that. I was really into still love them. And then I was getting tattooed by, my buddies who own a shop in Victoria, it's called Tech Noir Tattoo, fucking, of course. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. And before they owned that shop, it was, uh, I was just getting tattooed by one of them, and he was playing Carpenter Brute Trilogy. 
and I was like, what the fuck is this? And he told me, and then he also gave me gunship. And after that, I drove home. It was about an eight hour drive for me to get tattooed. So on the way home, I just went on Spotify and it was artist radio. You know, I was just through the wormhole the whole way, just artist similar to clicking artist similar to until I just was nonstop finding new artists. And yeah, then now it's just been constant wormhole. And now here you are. And now here I am sitting down with the Paradise Arcade Boys. Yeah. I feel like everyone has a similar like origin story. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, and it's very similar. Like you guys said, how, how it totally just became your entire world was the exact thing that happened to me. It was just like everything else disappeared. I'm like, what is this? This it's making me feel things. <laughs> your bathing suit area is getting tight. Yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. was pitching, I was pitching a tent for sure. I was ready to go camping. I'm like, <laughs> come on in we're going camping yeah so after you guys have been doing two poor bastards you had north innsbruck on you saw that this synthwave guest thing was working well for you guys what was the transition between two poor bastards and the paradise arcade how did that come about and when was the decision to change everything um we started i i think there was like there was a point where like we had lined a lot of guests up and it just was like clear like this is what the direction and the format really didn't fit anymore because we had hooked up with night ride fm right. towards the end of our two poor bastards um stint and like i love z he you know because he tolerate like he put our show on night ride fm as two poor bastards and like he loved it but it like it pissed everybody off they're like get this <laughs> off the fucking the thing i don't really like oh yeah they hated it they hated it z loved it uh and i again i always thank him for uh for being so supportive and um it just became apparent that like this is the most engagement we got this is what we're excited about that's the hook so right. we just made as it be, I, I don't exactly know what the exact like it's going to be this from now on, but it happened. And because I think uh, Watch Out for Snakes was our first uh, Paradise Arcade interviewee. Yeah. But it was actually booked originally as a Two Poor Bastards episode. OK. And I was like, I told him, like, hey, you know, sorry, it was going to be this thing, but we're actually switching shows. So this is what it's actually going to be now. So right. welcome to being guest number one at the Paradise Arcade. And we switched and kind of never looked looked back. Mm -hmm. Where did the name the Paradise Arcade come from? I was... I have a thing in my brain, and I, you probably know where I'm going. There has to be like a magical ring to a, a name, and I was trying to think of names, and <laughs> I, I'm dumb. I, I, I'm really dumb in retrospect. I thought, well, I don't want anything to be like obviously associated with synthwave i wanted to be like its own i was i was thinking of like a physical place that right. you would go to yeah and like thinking of like a scene and and that's what the show was and the paradise arcade i, I think i was just mashing shit together and it right. had that abracadabra ring to it and i'm like i like this set of words together totally. yeah and i am completely uncreative no creativity at all. And Eric's like, what do you think of this? I was like, oh, that sounds good. Yeah, like, that right, was it. That that does. I, I couldn't think of anything that sounded that good. So I was like, oh, let's go for it. But you created, you came up with the name Two Poor Bastards. That was yours. It's pretty easy. Yeah. I was trying to like work on puns for the first show, like, because I'm a dad at heart, I guess. So I was like, let's do like something with like pouring and like how to, you know, and I was like, I was spitballing a bunch of bullshit. And Kyle's like, this is all dumb. <laughs> and, and then you're like, and you literally said, how about two poor bastards? And I'm like, okay, done. That's it. That's, that's the name of the show. Kyle, you probably heard arcade and you were like, yeah, I'm, I'm in for that. It, it's, it's funny that that is the name that we ended up with for our location. Because here yeah. there is also 
uh, an arcade parts dealer called Paradise Arcade Shop. Yeah, oh. and we didn't realize that at the time. Yeah, I didn't. Re- I didn't realize that it, it local. It, so. If you go on Google and you type in the Paradise Arcade, because they pay for Google ads or whatever, it's, they technically come up as like the first search thing is Paradise Arcade Shop. I, I which click is not it, us. We have no. I click it every time. I have been on your guys' website oh, quite a few times in the last week and week or two, and I click the Paradise Arcade Shop every fucking time, and I go, God damn it! <laughs> yeah, not because us. Because it's the top one, and I go, fucking yeah, get out of here, Paradise Arcade Shop. So yeah, it's not only is it similar name. We have the yeah, it's yep. the, and but, there's yeah. no shop in our name, but no. they're also local. <laughs> yeah, it's... but you know, there's always different domain names. So I thought maybe you guys call it Paradise Arcade Shop. That's why I clicked the top one. And I was like, God damn it, this is no, definitely not, not them. No, and yeah. it's also funny that that's a thing with yeah. what I have. Yeah, being and I wasn't aware, and especially until it was too late. Do you go there? You buy parts I, from I them? Haven't. Oh, okay. No, I haven't. <laughs> You're like, fuck. I probably them. should. <laughs> or I probably shouldn't. I don't like go in there. Go. Don't say anything. Yeah. Don't go in there with that hat. I was going to say, maybe. take the hat off. <laughs> Actually, I don't think they let anybody go over there anymore because they had some stuff stolen from them. I remember seeing uh, a post on Facebook. So now no one's allowed in their stealing. store at all. Yeah. Like somebody stole a cabinet from their shop. That's not an easy thing to steal. No, definitely yeah. not. That's almost impressive. You're like, you got out of here with us in the store with an arcade cabinet? Yeah, you can keep it. Or did they break in after? I'm, sh- they, I'm they sure broke they broke in. in. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure yeah. they broke in. But still, that's got to be like stealing an ATM machine. I'm sure those things are fucking heavy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, pounds. that's the uh, that's the, the origin. There wasn't There wasn't, like, some, like... We were giving the people what they want. They, when we were doing Two Poor Bastards, more listens came into our, our synthwave-related stuff. Yeah. Right. And so we adjusted accordingly. Now, you know, we're, we're, we're more focused on electronic music in a general sense. Yep. Trying to, to re-broaden out and not be so focused on synthwave. Um, just because I think that's good for um, everyone. Lith- everyone. Totally. To not be so hyper focused. So yep. you know, it's still a core element of what we do. Obviously, it's it's still huge with Nitro Wave and the, the other things that we do. But to not be fixated on it, and I think that's I, I think the success ultimately now of where we're at is because we don't so strictly focus and call ourselves a synth wave show. Absolutely, that, you're not going to find anything that says Paradise Arcade is a synth wave show. It's electronic music. Yeah, and. I admire that because I thought the same thing. I didn't want to box myself in in creating a show where I was stuck doing actually just music. So, I mean, your guys, the way you put it is a lot better. Your blurb on your website is very well done. Mine is basically just sitting down with rad people who are doing rad things. And yeah, I just say that because I have, I don't want to say a background. It's more hobbies in graphic design and stuff like that. So I wanted to have artists in that regard on my show as well. And also people like you guys, people doing other podcasts and just not, I didn't want to be stuck doing one thing. I wanted to be able to broaden out and do anything that I wanted to. I'm trying to figure out a way to like get back into some of our broader scope. Cause you know, we had film directors on and, and writers and, video game people and all yeah. uh, just a huge variety of folks and you had cosplayers and there some, hey yeah yeah and we had uh That's cool and we we have some guests that were that were lined up that would be really cool i i'm just it just wouldn't fly as it is now so i'm trying to figure that out right. of how to like maybe loop back around to some really cool folks that we could have had on the show but we didn't or whatever I mean, we could technically do whatever we want. We can do Absolutely. whatever we want, and that's fine. And I mean, we still, that's exactly what the show is. is um, I don't think either one of us follow trends. It's literally, this is what we want to do. This is who we want to have on. This is what oh, we yeah. want to talk about. And you can see um, that, especially with the the guests you've been having on recently. You've been having on a lot of people that are uh, owners or contributors of some sort for labels, record labels, vinyl companies. Yeah. 
And that's been that's, a really I, cool insight for me to see personally because I, you know, a lot of people just engage with the music, engage with the music yeah. artists, and we all love the physicals. We all love the vinyl and the cassette tapes. I'm a big fan of cassette tapes, even though I know it's not as like good audio quality and all that, but we love these physicals, but you don't often think about the people who make them. So having those insights is, has been awesome. And I've been really appreciative to hear you guys having these guests on and finding out more about that aspect of the industry as well. Yeah. Because we're big vinyl boys. We love vinyl. And I, you know, I think our opinions are pretty clear on all the, the facets of, of vinyl and, and why we love and who does, who does things well and who, th who doesn't do things well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know what you uh, guys think about uh, certain I'm people. I'm not saying, any <laughs> not saying anything. Uh, so I wanted, <laughs> I, I think it was a good change to get into because everyone talks about, oh, I love, or like they would complain about something so stupid. Right. So like insignificant and make it this huge thing. And I'm like, you know, let's start having some of these people on because it's usually a one man show. Right. And it's so expensive and it's so time consuming to get into that. I think it's it's a fair service to put those things out there where if you are talking shit about a label and they actually do a really good job, like, well, OK, this is what they do. This is how this is how they got into it. This is the process that they do. And it's not easy. You, you can't yeah. just pick up and do it. Oh, shit. It's a huge commitment in every kind of way. And especially like you're saying, it gives people perspective of, holy fuck, this is just one or two or maybe just a very small team that's doing this. That's a lot I've never of work, met, man. I've never talked to anyone that has been more than a crew of two people. Yeah. That's crazy. It's slim pickings. Yeah. So when you get your shipping notification, a label has been printed. Yeah. You get your notification. It may be a couple of days until it gets sent out. Chill out, people. Yeah, no chill doubt. out. Relax. Although when when we did our thing, like I was like, we're getting this shit shipped out right away, so that does not happen. Yeah, right. What was your guys's first foray into the world of vinyl? Were you buying vinyl previous to listening to Synthwave? Have either of you uh -huh. been big yeah. vinyl fans for a long time? Yeah. 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 I kind of went in waves. I <laughs> I started. <laughs> I, I started out uh you know late teens early 20s oh yeah buying a lot of records that i was like oh i really love this album so like i see the vinyl for sale like oh i'm gonna get that because it's a cool thing right and my my parents had a record player it was not good but i was like well if i want to listen to it i have that option but i have these things because I like them and they're important to me. And this is a really cool format, you know, totally. regardless of, if I could play it or not. Yeah. I still wanted it to have a thing. Yeah. And I, I bought a bunch of stuff and I ended up selling or giving away a lot of it because I, you know, wasn't really doing anything with it. But then the bug came back and hit me again because it's, a, a in my opinion, a more engaging format to listen to music. Absolutely. It's not like streaming where it's just like, oh, skip, skip, skip. I don't like this. I'm not going to listen to it and end yeah. up listening to the same three things over and over again. You know, it, it forced me to appreciate an entire album. And I was like, OK, I really enjoy that. Got back into it again. And then. Yeah, with the synthwave stuff, it oh, just... if it's available, that's what I'm going to get. Yeah, I, I always had records. My, my parents had a record player growing up, uh, so I as they got out of music and out of things, I just inherited their shit. And then right. I was buying, uh, you couldn't buy vinyl for a while because it really wasn't prominent. And then electronic music, I would say like, oh, five, maybe it started to like, you started to see things come back. So I was getting some electronic albums around that time. I remember getting like the knife, um, records and, and stuff like that and and then obviously once synthwave hit and like that was the thing uh because you could get it and it, and i think when i first started collecting synthwave vinyl there wasn't such a feverish like if you didn't buy it right now you were not getting it right at that time you could buy a record and you could you could think about it be like oh well payday is friday so i could be responsible with my money and pick it up then and it's fine so like it was a very good thing to like interact with and you could buy it and you know, it was very reasonable pricing at that time. 
um, and you could get it. That the cool stuff that you wanted, you could get. And now it's like, unless you're on release date at the exact drop time, and it's a release of any note, you you have to be there at the zero zero one mark able to in order to get it. Yeah, the craziest I've seen has been Wave Shaper. It's like sold out immediately. Any merch he does, I bought one of his floppies. I have like his five five and a quarter nice. inch <laughs> floppy, and that was sold out in like seconds. Yeah, Insane. I got one of those too. Nice. So, so we rad. are a we're we're like a decent percentage then yeah. of the total audience who got that. They made ten and you and you're well, they made more than that, I'm sure. I gotta check. Mine's numbered. I probably I'm have not to. sure. Yeah, it's definitely numbered. I remember mine's somewhere behind me. I'm not sure where it is, but I got orange. Mine's black. Yeah. Classic. Didn't yeah. Tom say that he found those himself? And had a, I forget yeah, how. Yeah, like he, he had them sitting around and he thought, what could I use them for? Or did he go find them? I can't remember. Yeah, it's been a while since we talked. I to tried him. to get the action figure and I was I was there like F5 and the shit out of that. No <laughs> dice. Yeah. Was that, he did like a, the Phantom machine? Is that the action figure or is it different? Uh, the, the Station Nova girl. Oh, okay. I don't know if I even saw that. It was just gone. I didn't even get to see it. I didn't even know it. It was so. You didn't so even know it existed. It, yeah. And now, now that you know that it exists, now you're going to be sad. I shouldn't have said anything at all. Yeah. Know? Yeah. It's pretty crazy. The instant like release sold out landscape that you see now with it. And the thing that kills me that it's the shipping costs for a lot of it. It's hard to stomach on some of them. Well, you're in Canada, so that's why it sucks to be you. Yeah, for sure. I've I've seen cassette tapes having over twenty dollars shipping, and that's double the okay. price of the tape itself. And I'm like, oh mm-hmm. man, I really fucking want this, but I can't. I just can't do it. And then you get that major FOMO because what you're taught, like you're saying, it's gone. And then most of the times, it's not even ever done again. Yeah, I mean that's really it's the beautiful thing about it, and the awful thing about it is it's. It's a really highly curated, special, low quantity meant for just the people that actually want it. But yeah. uh, unless you get it in the here or now at exactly that time, you're not getting it. Yeah. I bought the Comtrue's 8-track Galactic Melt thing. I don't have an 8-track player. I don't yeah. know when the fuck I, I'm never going to play that. I mean, I'm all for buying weird shit, but like 8-track, that's... I can draw my line there. I, I, <laughs> I am also I'm also a cassette tape fan. Yeah. Too. Um so I'm fine with that, but A track, that's I just thought the, the, the format was so bizarre and the packaging because cause you know that like Seth made uh, okay. I'll he give designed you a very stylish uh piece of kit. He designed it himself. He did all the formatting, he did all that shit himself. So you know that it's like this almost this beautiful work of art on its own. Yeah, and I'm gonna have it ruined by having him sign it at some point. <laughs> Whenever I get it, it still has it. They haven't shipped it out yet. They still manufacture eight tracks. They found a boutique person, um, who okay. does low quantities of it. Like and it's a, like a person, one guy, <laughs> probably on Etsy or something. That's <laughs> Probably is how they found it. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt either. It's pretty much anything you want. You could search it on Etsy and you might, you might be able to find it. I was actually amazed to discover just that they still manufacture cassette tapes. Apparently Canada is one of the places that a lot of cassette tapes are actually manufactured in. It's a format that, um, is very stable. You could basically keep it in perpetuity as long as you keep it away from a magnet. It's cheap. And it's right. cheap. Yeah. So, and there's still professional services that use it. I, did you know that A tracks were still in professional use, like in medical and TV things up into the uh, mid 90s? I'm not surprised. Because there are certain uh, institutions that they adopt a format, and that's just how it is. You don't, like right. when I was in radio, it was mini discs. We only use mini discs. It was the weirdest thing. And they wouldn't go away from that. Like, well, they had that, to. That's, that's just, yeah, they had to. That's just the way it is. We will not change until we are absolutely forced to. So yeah. You're using this. Yeah. <laughs> I guess when there's like monetary restrictions, like, hey, we have to switch 
every possible piece of gear we have to this new technology, you're probably going to be a little bit resistant. I know that in radio, the reason my 8-track tapes were so attractive is because they're basically instant cue. Like you could, you would do like a five second um, cue up on a, for a radio station or something like that, and it would play instantaneously. Whereas other physical formats, you, you couldn't do that. Like a cassette tape doesn't have that ability to do. So that's why right. it was used for so long. Until digital obviously made it obsolete. Yep. I started getting Just into look. buying cassette tapes with Synthwave. But I also, I do a lot of thrifting. We've got like some awesome grandma run thrift stores here. Oh yeah. They're the best. And on my Instagram, it says I'm a Reader's Digest tape collector because I am. I find (laughs) these Reader's Digest tapes that are fucking unreal. They're classical music that are often renditions of popular movie themes. And they're, they're incredible. And I have so many of them. There's like the many moods of romance or starlight <laughs> desires. Nice. So Ooh. yeah, man, they, we get sensual with the cassette tapes up here. Who is naming that shit? Yeah. Props to them. Yeah, no kidding. That's the Reader's Digest. They have these boxes. I got I'm, I'm going to show you guys one. Here's I feel this. a little tingly. This is a, this is a box set. Starlight Piano. Ooh. Oh my goodness! Isn't that just that, it sensual? sets the mood? It's and so tickling sensual. my ivories. <laughs> and this was just from a fucking thrift store, and I bought one just to play it. I'm like, let's see, let's see what this is like. And both me and my girlfriend loved it. We're like, this is amazing. So I've been buying every fucking Reader's Digest tape I and can find. And now it's the bedroom music. Oh yeah, especially the many moods of romance. <laughs> How so you guys, there, uh, um, there's like, you know, when you're wanting to just get it done, and then there's the sensual. You oh, know, yeah, the there, warming up. It's at least two, <laughs> two that I can name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about all I know. <laughs> Sounds about right. What you were got, you saying? I'm sorry. No, it's all good. You guys got into vinyl production yourselves, starting. Yeah. A label called Cryptogem. Yeah. What's that been like? <laughs> uh it's it's an interesting learning curve. It's got I it's gone really well. I'm a- happy with the final product and the response there it is. is just right here. Yeah, there it is. Hey, thank you for buying it. Awesome. It's beautiful. I can't play it on anything, but well, thank you for purchasing. Thank you for the support. Yeah. With the expensive shipping. Yeah. No, actually, what it wasn't bad. It wasn't like a twenty dollars cassette tape shipping. But. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. You start doing the show, and th- we have a lot of things that go on that people don't ever see that I'm involved with or Nitro Wave. You start making connections. You start talking to people, and you start saying, you start like, ah, oh, good. Would it be great to do this thing? Or what if we could play live? Or or whatever it is and and you get together with people and they go well well why why can't we do that and this is right. this scene there is no barrier there is no well you've got to know an a and r guy and a lawyer and you know when i was doing metal stuff you had to know a pr person in a certain department and you had to, you know you had to have all these connections and this it's well there is no limits you could just do it why not do it right. and we just got to know we made friends and we're like well what if what if we do it and and kyle has more expertise in that background just you know you're so versatile in your knowledge and you know so many things you know where things are being pressed you know who's pressing what and who to go through and what the pitfalls are and what the important things are like well well let's do it let's let's do a record let's just get one out there even knowing all the pitfalls (laughs) We still did There's it. There's still pitfalls. Yeah. Oh, I can imagine. There's, and it was a long process, you know, with, with uh, the Baldocaster thing. We talked about it when he was on the show initially, planted the seed of the idea, and he was he was bound by the contract of laser discs. So right. we, we kept talking about it because at the time, like, he really wasn't as prominent as he is now. I just stayed in touch with him. He, he became a really good friend. And, uh, and so when the time actually came 
that his rights came back and we were talking about it, it was like, oh shit, uh, we better we better do this or or just let it go. Right. And I think uh, North Innsbruck is also part of of Cryptogem, so yep. the three of us all came together and we're like, well, fuck it, let's do it, let's do this this thing and start the process. And so, you know, Dave was really supportive of that and so we had it mastered for vinyl we had the artwork finished for it because the original physical release they just took the front cover and put it on the back and put track listing over the top of it and we're mm. like that's not gonna do it so dave right. uh recommissioned the original artist to do the additional artwork to complete the whole thing and and we wanted like let's do it let's do something that we're proud of let's do something that like if we could have our hands on because there's a lot, there's, there's people that do it well, vinyl and yep. the people that don't do it well. Right. And we wanted to have a release that we could do well and not it go to somebody that was shitty. Right. And so we did it. And then now it's, now we have more projects to figure out what we actually want to do than what we can actually do. So you know, there are things in, we are working on things now. We can't really say what those things are. We have a lot of options. We have a lot of excitement. Just know that we took the lessons of the first press and we're going to, we're going to take it and, and then make it even better for the next thing that we do. And have yeah. taken all of those, those things and are going to make something better. So we've got a release that'll be out, a co-release that'll come out this year with another company. Oh, right. Companies. And then we're mulling over what our next project is and what that looks like. But luckily, it was successful enough that we're able to do the next project. We were yeah. able to make our money back on it. So that is the ultimate validation of like, okay, we did something correctly. Oh, yeah. That's huge. Making the money back is fuel for the next thing. Saying, what's next in this? And that's rad. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy to hear that because... It's a great package. I think it looks awesome. And I really wish I could listen to it because I know how you guys are with vinyl. I'm, I could guarantee it's fucking top notch sound quality. So I really wish I could hear it, but I'll spend a long time with the master or with the test presses, making sure that they were exactly as they needed to be. I figured and we listened and we listened to the vinyl masters before they went off to production to make sure that it, sounded not weird it was a lot of critical listening yes yeah. no yeah. there wasn't much enjoyment it was a lot of like stressing like <laughs> how good. much hate am i gonna get yeah if if i uh, if it didn't meet my standards it, it would have never happened yeah right and but that's good you guys are coming from appreciators i don't know if that's a word i might have just made that up appreciators Fine. let's of... roll with it of the music. That's the first and foremost thing is you are fans of the music. You love the music and you yeah. want something that you create to sound good and represent that music accurately. And that's admirable. And, you know, especially being someone who's a huge fan of the music myself, that's can't play the record on anything and listen to it. I definitely appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I love how this scene um is very much rewards the people that that do it so like there's not necessarily a lot of synthwave concerts uh you know there was a couple of scenes on either coast uh but there really wasn't unless they were the big magic sword dance with the dead perturbator there really wasn't right. anyone coming through our town so it was like well if no one's gonna book these shows then we have to do it ourselves yep and so again we started really small and now it's a it's a whole thing you know, on its own. And, you know, now we're, we're booking shows and, ha and we're bringing, there's a little synth wave live community in, in where we're at now, because we just were like, well, if someone isn't going to do it, we're going to do it just so that it's here. And it, it's, that's also really turned out really well. People have really responded to it. People have no idea what synth wave is or going to these concerts going, doing it, having the same feeling that we had, like, well, what the fuck is this? I need more of right. it. Tell me, I need all of it. Where's the fire hydrant of Synthwave? Give it to me. And you're, like, fucking opening the hose, just spraying these motherfuckers in the face. 
Exactly. Right here. Right here. <laughs> Take the synth. That was a perfect segue. You're just handing these to me, man. Nitro Wave. Tell me about that and the start. That's you basically just told me the start of it. But what's it been like doing these live events? You guys have essentially created a synth wave community in the Twin Cities, which I have no idea what Twin Cities are. I'm just saying yeah, that because I know what yeah, it I, is. I love it. Thank you. You, you're just you're validated right now, Kyle. I am. I, I, oh, it's, it's, I always say the Twin. It like, comes out. Yeah, we're based out of Twin Cities, and Kyle's like just always shakes his head. He's like, <laughs> no one knows what that means. Well, I'm from Canada, so other people in the States might have a more of a... Oh, they have no idea. They have no idea. (laughs) I'm just so used to saying it because it's it's the colloquial thing. Uh, (laughs) Twin Cities is Minneapolis, St. Paul. It's two cities next to each other, divided by a river, and that's it. Right, right. And people from here will say that our baseball team is named because of that. Okay. Yeah, the Minnesota Twins. And yeah, unless you're from here or realize that people have no idea. And I say that like nobody knows what that is. Nobody. Nobody. That's fair. I'm going to still say it. I don't give a shit. Old habits <laughs> die hard. Uh, yeah. I feel like I'm in the middle of a domestic dispute a little bit right now. <laughs> now nah. you started this. You started it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you don't get it between us. I'm just going to step back and watch it. <laughs> watch it evolve. Uh, but yeah, Nitro Wave uh, is primarily was Chris and myself, North Innsbruck. And we yep. had two different ideas, I would say, in like 20, late 2018, 2019, where we saw there was a lot of excitement and energy. And we're both trying to find ways to... Like, how do you centralize it? How do you do? I was thinking more like internet based. And Chris was the guy that came up and said, well, let's start local. Let's start it here. So he went and used uh, Neon Fox's Google Doc of where all the synthwave bands are located. And he goes, well, look, how many synthwave acts are there in Minneapolis in the St. Paul area? And it turns out there's a shit pile of them. Like, we have a huge amount of synthwave acts based out of where we're at. So... He just initially suggested on Twitter, I think, to everybody that was Synthwave to get together and have a meeting and just kind of discuss Synthwave and what that looked like. And, and by that time, Chris and I were, were really good friends. So we got together and it was uh, Galaxy 80 was there and Night Odd and Denotive and... There's a few other folks there. I, I forget Mike Resendez, who is a media person. And um, we decided, well, what do we want to do? And it's like, well, let's put together a show. What is a show like? Because no one had done it yet. No one had right. put, done a, a show locally for what Synthway based around it. So we were like, well, maybe in six months we could put together a show. And Chris had a connection to a record store and let us like just fuck around in the back while people customers were shopping for records. And like, and I think like 20 people were there and 15 of them were for nitro wave. Yep. It may have been 15 people there and 14 of them there were there for nitro wave. <laughs> it could have been that. And it was like on an old shitty PA system. Like it was really, it was not great. Right. I was really unpolished, but we had a lot of fun. I'm like, well, let's do the next thing. And it just kept building. There was a certain level of crust that was uh, yeah. sort of lovable about that, though. It was, a, it was love crust. <laughs> yeah. Well, well used. Well worn. Well That's loved. A, that sounds like a Kiss song. Love crust. <laughs> <laughs> it may be. It may be. And it, but people were responding to it. The customers that showed up were like, well, what is this? What's going on? And it was just really unrefined people who had maybe never played live before right. figuring their shit out. Like Chris brought in his entire studio rack mount. It set it up on like these shitty tables that was, that were rickety. <laughs> and he's got like $5,000 of equipment on a $50 table that could collapse at any time. <laughs> it's a $50 table is really giving it a lot. Yeah. Right? It may have been a $20 50 cent credit. Yeah. Right? And, uh, table. But then we got hooked into, like, everybody knew somebody 
in within the group. Like, well, I know this person who plays this thing, who's a graphic designer or who or like, oh, I do karaoke or I do movie trivia. Maybe I'll talk to this person to see if they'll let us like book a night. And then we, and it just rolled from there. And then we'd like, someone came through uh town on tour and we did that. And that went really well. And so we were going from like, 10 people, 15 people, 30 people in attendance to going to being like 100, 150 people, 200 oh, people damn. in attendance really quickly. Um, and to the point where we're booking Makeup and Vanity Set, Tone Box, yeah. Baldo Caster, you know, having really big synthwave shows, uh, considering and developing really good relationships with venues. Right. And now being a you know, now we work with the other promoters around the country and basically people know, like, yeah. you know, we worked with, uh, we worked at dance with the dead and magic sword when they came through. Yeah. So that was a nitro wave concert. That was a huge thing. And that same thing. You with, did a uh, DJ set. One of you did a DJ set, didn't you? Kyle? Not at that show. Not the magic sword. No. Oh, oh. Bionic Jones. Oh, that was it was Nick. Yeah. I, I forced him to do it because I was too nervous. <laughs> That's fair. You dabble in the DJing though. Uh, I th I thought that would be a good idea, but I I always get uh, a little bit nervous beforehand. And you do a lot of like a lot of like tinkering and figuring out song flows and yeah. like map stuff out and. I know, maybe. I'm thinking too much about it. I think I'm the same as problem. you, man. When I did like my first ever Twitch, just fucking around DJ set, I had like this huge note that was all about when I was going to start the next track and yeah. how I was going to fade it. And time out. Yeah. Puke break. <laughs> nice. Not for me, at least. This time. <laughs> Oh, I'm do talking you cut your Celsius. Own wood? I'm talking Celsius. Just so you yeah. Know. Do you cut your own wood? I do. I mean, being uh, from Canada, in the woods, do you cut your own wood? I do. I You're, are you a woodsman? Would you say that you're a woodsman? I would say I'm like a obvious woodsman. But if you're talking about, do have I cut trees <laughs> down on my property and used those trees to heat my house in the winter? Yes, I did that last year. You do it with your shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> almost always almost always. all right perfect <laughs> where are we going with this i'm curious <laughs> I, I you know i whoever you know if people are doing that i just get like the typical movie scene of someone yeah, yeah. chopping wood i think it doesn't matter schwarzenegger doing it yeah, yeah i was it gonna say it. arnold schwarzenegger with the log over his shoulder when he's walking back to his place and that's commando isn't it yeah yeah, yeah that's that's me except not anywhere near as large as arnold schwarzenegger or is handsome. It's like it could be zero degrees outside. It could be 30 degrees outside. Kyle, I'm thinking of, I don't know what to call it yet, but the basic premise is we pull up. I'll just throw it up here. You guys can see it. It's a movie title generator. So what we do is throw <laughs> a movie genre here. We create the title and then we make up what we think the story is of this movie with um our our personal cast and score and an original motion picture going as fucking wild as we want or as tame as we want whatever i think it's gonna get pretty ridiculous but it's sexual deviant <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> hell yeah we can i don't this think it's gonna reveal some, i'm pretty some sure shit. the movie type there isn't a porn option but um well, we'll we see. can make Let's anything look. a porn isn't that like rule 34 or something everything you can oh. think of is a porn is a porn it's already only. been if you can think of it it's already been done right or somebody is into it yeah okay so it, here's what i'm thinking <laughs> Chucky doll porno. You think someone's done that? Oh, for oh, sure someone's already done that. That's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. Why? <laughs> Who's into that? Why? Why not? The the question is not why. <laughs> why not? It's when. It's when, how, and, and how soon. <laughs> what genre are you guys into? What do you think? Yes. We, yes. Sci-fi children. Maybe we should leave that one out. Yeah. Let's not do that. 
skip that one. I'm feeling something like sci-fi, fantasy, Home or art. horror. Go ahead. Get it up. Cue it up. I know you're a big fan of horror, Eric. Oh, yeah. Let's do horror. You guys see in this? Can you see it on the on yep, my screen yeah. here? Yeah, okay. All right. I let's... mean, not the whole screen, but enough. Yeah, yeah. I only put it over top of my stuff beside my fucking stupid head here. We're only going to do one. We get one shot at this to, to make a okay. ridiculous movie. Daily mobility sessions. All right. I actually subscribed. What? That's a horror movie? Knowing my dreams. That sounds too much like like Freddy Krueger shit, but I'm sure we can make a rip off of that. I uh, do you do you want to like I'll give I think it's permissible cuz that is not an exciting title. That's a terrible title. That is an awful you, movie title. Go ahead and re just do it again. Okay, thank yeah. I was, let's, I was let's get something exciting. Like let's get know, something. That knowing fired. my dreams is garbage. That's not a horror movie. You know what? All they did was added knowing on top of the movie no, it's in dreams. It's not my dream. Yes. In dreams. Okay, let's do another one. You know, I did suggest we do like Hallmark esque movie. Oh shit. And that would have fit the bill. No, in <laughs> yeah. my dreams. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. Or a Christian, like Hallmark. Hallowed movie. by the Mist. I feel like it was supposed to be hallowed, but they went with hallowed. Hallowed by the Mist. Okay. That's good because that is a particular plot point yeah. that we have to reference. That's right. In some way, hollowed by the mist. Okay, so we can go with, you know, classic. We, we can just rip off of the mist here. That's the obvious thing to go off of is the mist. There's a, there's a world. There's people that don't know what's happening. No, you know what? Let's not do that. That's too easy. That's too easy. It's horror. Yeah, it's, it's, horror. it's horror. We don't want to rip off of the world being mist. So what does it mean to be hollowed by the mist? Maybe we should figure out what that means first. What does being hollowed by the mist mean? I feel like there's the mist. It's post whatever happened to bring this in. People yeah. know what happened. It is like an extreme case of Ebola. Oh. <laughs> if the mist gets you, it's this like instantaneous evacuation of all oh. your internal bits. How about it flips you inside out? Because here is, here is what instantly came to mind. It's a new product on the on the market. It's hot. You need to get it. Everyone is doing this product. Go to the supermarket. You're getting it. The families love it. It is marketed to moms. The okay. the mist, the mist of your house. You bring it in. You bring it home. You turn it on. And you know what? They switch the product around. It is not the newest amazing scent to cleanse your house and your spirit. It is actually government waste. Oh. That has been put into this product. Okay. Oh, maybe. It is now contaminated all of this product. Everyone has it because the want, the need for it was so much that it was instant sellout. Yeah. So every household has the mist because it was marketed as a reinvigorating product that is going to uh, bring you, you know, like calmness. And you're gonna find synergy. Oh. It's like a total lifestyle. Everything like it brings you to center. Crystal, yeah, Myth the crystals. Form crystals. Yes, I like this. So it is. It's cleansing, right? So everyone has it. But the problem is, is that in production, something was contaminated. It was a government uh, byproduct, a waste. And you know what it does? Opposite. Oh God, it's, it's horrible. It's, it's the, the opposite. opposite. It doesn't fucking make you calm. It enrages you. It makes and you, you like back. kill it. Lit it literally hollows you out. So what I see is like this soccer mom with her kids and like, oh, my God, I'm going to put this on. It's going to be amazing and puts it on in the first scene. Like he puts it on like it sprays the mist into the air and she breathes it in. Like literally you see this person just breathing in this mist. And then the first thing you see is a close up on the face and the eyes literally suck into the head like Revert. It's just like a vacuum from inside the body sucks the eyes out, and then the rest of the body starts to collapse inside of itself. But then it cuts away, right? And it's she's sitting at a table. Can I stop you? Go ahead. Maybe something else. Maybe 
mentally yeah it mentally it hollows, hollows you. you yeah oh my goodness not physically that's oh. what i was thinking too it it hollows you out mentally so there's nothing left but like rage and hatred and oh yeah. yes and so then and it... go on go, go no you go i was gonna say like that's a great way it starts maybe it is that like it does the opposite effect of the of what it's sold as. It does the opposite. But what if it finishes up? What if if like the coup de gras? What if the finisher is that it turns you inside out? Like you just, and then it's just oh. a wet mess on the floor. So it as, like, hollows defin- you out mentally first, and then yeah. after your fucking rage is complete, you just and turn into this and, wet mess on the ground of intestines and body parts. And that's and, how it spreads, because you turn into a mist. You hollow yourself. A pink it, mist. A pink mist. A pink and mist. And then if that pink mist gets onto you, then now you've been infected by this new thing, and it spreads that way. Okay, so in these movies and these styles of movies, there's always people who are resilient. Mm. Maybe these people are just... The ones who didn't buy this mist diffuser. They were like the poor people. Because they <laughs> they reject modernity and embrace tradition. They reject these modern concepts of comfort and pseudo enlightenment. And like, I'm not about this. Much like Kyle. Kyle types are, are rejecting. Right. These these ideas of comfort, easy comfort. I wouldn't make crystal water. <laughs> so <laughs> That's I, I, fair. It probably wouldn't be a product that I would get. See, I feel like in and this so, story, too, there's a whistleblower like the person who's manufacturing it knows that the government contaminated it. So there's like the whistleblower person, too, that's kind of there to figure it out. We always have to have that character. That's the scientific like nerd, you know, like Goldeneye. You have yeah. the, the Boris kind of. Natalia, they have that. Yeah. So it was being manufactured, and there was an earthquake, and it <laughs> opened up where radioactive waste was being held, and then it went into the holding tanks for it. Yeah, and there was dangerous sharks involved. All right, we're going too crazy now. Uh, okay, I, I thought we we're like going like way for it. Oh, we're we're going all in. I think we should figure out a cast. We need, like, the protagonist who is immune to this mist, who's trying to get to the bottom of it. And I don't know, typically in these two, he's probably trying to save his kid or something. He was, like, separated from his daughter, and now he's trying to get back to his daughter and worried about if she has been I feel like Thomas Jane is in this. Thomas Jane. Nick Nick Cage. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Thomas Jane and Nick Cage are in a relationship. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And they adopted a kid that they're trying to get yeah. back to. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Thomas Jane. Where does this take place? It's the United States. Yeah, okay. That's I was pretty... going to say I was going to say some Canadian place like Toronto. That's pretty big. I think for the people to be like against modernity, it should probably be a uh, like offshoot they should be in a small town like they're like oh we're Literal not minnesota <laughs> o- oklahoma oklahoma the panhandle state they're just sitting on their rocking chairs as they see these people just running through the streets killing people and then exploding into mist yeah because they're good hearty people so they're gonna there's gonna be more of an ability to reject these hoity-toity ideas yep. salt of the earth folk yeah, mm. like Thomas Jane and Nick Cage clearly are. Iceland. Iceland. Okay, I'm fine with Whoa. that too. Okay, and it's just perpetual nighttime because we're going for a horror movie. So it's oh yeah, it's like it's, it's either nighttime. winter or summer, whatever. Yeah, whatever the season is, where it's pure nighttime up there. I think it's winter. I think that's. I'm, pr- I'm pretty yeah. sure it's winter too. If it makes sense. <laughs> I'm pretty sure like Midsommar is like pure daytime, so I think winter's a yeah. I'll be a safe bet on that. Iceland, Nick Cage, Thomas Jane in a sexual relationship. This is not a porno yeah. still. Still a horror movie. <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Yet. Their kid is well, like, where? No, so their kid is their kid is the antidote. By an, 
Oh my god. Oh well, you know, we can go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because we don't know the origin of where this kid came from. Recent adoptee. Maybe we don't they, even right. need the kid. Right. Right. Because they were struggling to have a kid naturally. They couldn't That's figure right. out why. <laughs> <laughs> so they had they were forced to adopt. <laughs> They adopted from this like super shady government agency that they're yes. like not sure where this kid came from. They're like, basically we're just forced to take this child, but they haven't seen go. the kid yet, or what? You you brought that plot plot point in. Uh, maybe they're they the kid's coming <laughs> on a boat. <laughs> How do they love? Why do they love the child then? Was because this... they've been trying so hard to have this kid, oh, but everything's yeah. going on, and the right. kid's coming, and if the kid gets there, and so shit's they're going down. Driven by parental instinct <laughs> to move the plot forward. I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah, it's a powerful motivation. Sight unseen child. Yep. Got it. It's the been everything what they've... they've always wanted. Exactly. It's been everything they've ever wanted in their life, so they're willing to just do anything they have to to get this child right because it can't conceive naturally who's the child that's actor what's well, i think it should be like it, an adult that's just they I just, was just going to say that christine Wieg. <laughs> they just use camera manipulation to make it look david like a hobbit spade. Dave, david spade <laughs> with a mustache it, no with a mustache <laughs> he's like got just habit. really bad de-aging with the mustache still yeah he has to have it. Perfect. Or a really old Danny DeVito. Oh my god, yeah. Just Danny DeVito as is right now. Current Danny DeVito playing a nine-year-old yeah. girl. Girl. Hey, I'm a kid. Look at me, I'm a kid. <laughs> Look, I'm holding the lollipop and everything. <laughs> Perfect. I love uh, this. It's great. What's the... We need like a... A climax? Where does the story reach its Whoa. climax? Well, you're getting... I don't have, I'm not talking about between that. Nick Cage and Thomas Jane here. Okay, so... What? They, the, I would say if the moment we meet the child is the climax the of Danny, the Danny DeVito, which happens to be, like, the reason that this is happening. But their love for this child is too extreme that they can't get rid of them. They can't. So it's like the end of the mist, right? A little bit. Like that, you know, the tragic ending of the mist, the hey, new mist. Isn't Thomas Jane in the mist? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's I'm, why I brought it up. I don't know why I didn't fucking pull that together. Until you said the ending of the mist, I'm like, got flashbacks of how traumatic the ending of that movie was. And I'm like, wait, that was Thomas Jane. I was keeping in theme here, and you didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize it. Uh, sorry, go on, though. You were saying the end of the mist. Yeah, the end of the mist where it's like that, that tragedy. So, But they're faced with the same sort of decision. But like, how does that decision... It's got to be different. They got to so fight like, each other. They have to have this epic battle, like they live style, that fight scene in the alleyway where Thomas Jane and Nick Cage are fighting each other. Well, there can only be one. Yeah. yeah. Then Christopher Lambert shows up somehow. <laughs> and he could say there can only be one. There can only be one. No, he's Raiden. Oh, he's Raiden. Oh, he's Raiden in this one. Okay. Does he just... do the laugh? Yes. <laughs> he just just laughs on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's just this omniscient god that Yes. Relinquishes the control of this miss. Okay, so who would score this? Who do you guys think would be a good score for this movie? Toto. <laughs> I was thinking maybe yeah. Bon Jovi. Oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> I can get behind that. Yeah. So it's all like cowboy themed. Yeah. I was going to say so it's <laughs> like Morris Day. Like, or like, um, Hall and Oates, maybe? No, uh, no, no, let's not drag them into this. Okay, we're not going to drag them. I just, <laughs> I was thinking of like a musical juxtaposition to the to the weight of the emotional, right. uh, like right. thing of this movie, the horror, the 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 sadness. Huey Lewis. So <laughs> Huey Lewis, or 
right sad fred you know what let's make it an original motion picture soundtrack and we can have all of these people contributing tracks to this oh my goodness yeah it's like that, flash like, dance each... I, I want people to think about this like they think about the hacker soundtrack yes <laughs> yes so each scene is like an iconic sound like it's like you're like okay i'm hearing it i'm here for it yeah toto would be the intro scene you know, everyone's yeah, happy. The and theme music by Toto. Yeah. Yeah. Bon Jovi can do the them arguing when they're talking about how they can't have a kid. And it's like super sad cowboy because they're country bumpkins. Like yeah. Riding their motorcycle. <laughs> and their six guns. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. They're fucking steel horses. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see. This Are there chaps involved? Always. Okay. Assless. Well, all chaps are assless. Are they? I yes. guess that's what makes them chaps. Somebody, otherwise, they would be pants. But what's Somebody the distinction? <laughs> Why do people call them assless chaps then if all chaps are assless? They're stupid. That's yeah. Why. That's just a that's a redundancy. That's like I'm googling to see if there's assed <laughs> chaps. <laughs> yeah, they're called leather pants. Is what they're called. Hold your horse. Hold your steel horses. <laughs> I will not hold my steel horses. I will ride. Okay. He's a cowboy. I may go to the danger zone after this. Oh boy. You watch yourself. Kenny Loggins is also on this soundtrack. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Why There's not? a mystery composer that you have to you just don't know. You unlock as as a DVD special feature. <laughs> okay. Credit to Eric. The first thing that popped up on, on Google was a Reddit uh, thing that says, why are they called assless chaps? Ass chaps are just leathered pants. There's no such thing as assed chaps. But my ass chapped I'm talking about it. It's, yeah. Oh, that's fucking hilarious. All right. I think we got a good thing that we could submit to uh, someone who's yeah. making movies. Let's do this. Get this written up. Let's get the treatment going. Um, it, it'll get rejected. It's not uh, a redo of an old movie. Maybe A24 will pick it up. I A24 think A24 would, be into would it. gobble this right up. Yeah, they would definitely be into it. You've had a lot of really awesome guests on your show. I'm curious if yeah. there's anyone that you guys haven't had on yet that you have been really wanting to get on the show. Uh, there, I think we both created a list when we first started the Paradise Arcade. Yep. And we got pretty much everybody. There's one person who will never be on the show, um, and that's Perturbator. Right. Uh, he's, I've had great conversations with him. He's very personable, but he is so over being associated with even the slightest hint of Synthwave that it doesn't matter that we are not a synthwave focused show but because we live a bit into that world yeah. he won't he just refuses and he's very always always very diplomatic about it and he's never been um right. you know like anything other than very nice and and appreciative yeah but that was one person so i'm at this stage where i'm like well do i even really want him if someone doesn't want to be on the show why would you want them to be on the show in the first place absolutely you know what i mean like yeah so like and at this point his the questions that I would want to ask him, he would just be pissed off by. Like, I don't, you know, again, you don't yeah. want to like purposely go. If the only thing you have to say to someone is something that would irritate them, then what's, yeah, yeah, yeah. why even, what's the point? That's fair. So, um, that's sort of like kind of the one that like got away, but <laughs> really was never a thing to get in the first place. Right. Um, so like, there's not like to me, and he wasn't even number one. The number one was Com Trues, and he's been on the show twice. Yeah. So and maybe maybe more than twice. Maybe more. Yeah. Maybe I mean, he's you know we didn't yeah, he just we'll come see. on with with make him a vanity set? Wasn't that? Was... Oh yeah, we could talk about that. That's fine. Yeah. No, you guys um, posted yeah. a picture of it, so I'm just being an idiot when I'm. Yeah. Everyone this. knows. So he you know he was <laughs> on with uh, Mavs, and that was like a highlight. That was like a that was like a everything you could wish for and want for me personally yeah I oh got, man i got to be a fly on the wall for that so yeah. that was even better such a cool idea man i really loved how you guys just wanted to get two artists to talk to each other and especially makeup and vanity set 
he is so well spoken. You know, every time I listen to him talk, I'm like, he's he's intelligent. He seems like a very smart person, very well spoken, and he's he he's loves good to, talk to listen too. That's to. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt is um he's a great guy. He's very articulate. He's very well spoken, as you said. Uh, very thoughtful in his questions, and and I I just I like being around the dude. So. Right. Uh, we had him on, and I was, and and I am always thinking of ways to try and make the show interesting for myself, maybe yeah. more than anyone. And so we, you know, we've done like the album deep dive shows, and yeah. and uh, you know, and I and I had Hotel Pools help me interview Comtrues the first time, and then Makeup to Vanity Set came on and did an album deep dive with us, and then he helped me interview Memorex Memories. So I'm like, you know. Yep. And I know Matt at this point in, in a more personal level. So I was like, hey, let's, you want to do this? And who would say no to that? Who would be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk to Comtrues. Right. Like, that's not a real thing. That's not a thing that someone would say, unless they were so nervous and right. overwhelmed. You know, and I was, I was going to say, you know, there's the whole, the risk, you know, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Right. There's always the risk of, yeah, meeting someone that you think's a complete fucking asshole and it ruins your entire... But I've already... I know Matt pretty well, and I know Seth at least on a, at a baseline level, so I knew that it was going to be fine. Yeah. There was no risk in that. Well, I mean, pair. it's like if you took someone else. Oh, sure, sure. And we're like, hey, do you want to talk to this person? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I curate everything. You know, that's what we do. So, yeah, that was just a, it was a thing I proposed. I proposed it beginning of this year and seth didn't get back to me forever uh, for a long time and then he was like yeah let's do it and i was like Ugh. oh shit i bet it. and here's the thing i'm gonna fess up to this i didn't tell makeup and vanity set i proposed this <laughs> i just said hey would you want to sit down with makeup and vanity set and and talk artist to artist and i didn't tell matt about it i just <laughs> i just fucking did it and then now coming up in june when seth got back to me i'm like hey matt um, just so you know, would, do you want to ever talk to Tom Trues as an artist, an artist thing? And, and I, I bounce ideas off of Matt for other stuff. So like he and I have different conversations. So like, it's not, it's not uncommon that I would pose something like that to him. And, um, he's like, well, yeah, duh. Like, obviously I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And we made it work. And I was like that. It was great. It was amazing. Seth it really enjoyed himself, and that's really the the thing you want at the end yeah. of the day is people to to enjoy themselves on the show. So that's how we keep getting. I think that's the secret sauce yeah. with how we keep getting like Ghost or whoever it is, is that the word of mouth amongst artists go, yeah, we had a good time on the show. Totally, they're good guys. They're good guys to talk to. So and then people just say yes, yeah. and, and that helps. Yeah, other artists, you know, they want to we ask them to be on the show they listen to episodes that we've done yeah and yeah. then they say yes because oh, all these other people have done it sure yeah yeah or like you know or word of mouth like um i you know, like makeup of vanity said is as big advocates of ours um and won't you know he'll always sing our praises to people um wave shaper has been really good to us he's helped us it hasn't lined up yet but he's hooked us up with some artists that are bigger and outside of the synth wave world that we'll see i'm not going to say what it is but if it breaks through works out for us that's going to be really cool and again it's just really the experience of the people that come on and that's the most important thing more than anything i think is their ex people's experience and what you're doing and Absolutely. and it's been our it's been our secret sauce the whole time if people have a good time that's you you guys have done your job in my opinion and, and we're kind of like regular people yeah. sort of yeah we're mostly normal totally we're somewhat not, we're not too weird you're the perfect amount of weird <laughs> charming charming amount uh, of weird charming you yeah you endearing. know when someone says yes. that endearing oh, we're in the endearing way i'm weird yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i'm not gonna grab your ass i'm gonna you know <laughs> maybe give you a compliment first <laughs> check the waters <laughs> yeah i'll ask permission what do you guys think's next for you? Well, uh, the next thing, I think um, for us, you're starting to see the transition, which is we don't record as often. 
and we're getting involved behind the scenes a lot more. So you see with CryptoGem, and there's going to be some other projects that are going to come out that you're going to see our names eventually attached to. Um, and then the writing piece. So I'm doing a lot of written articles uh, because there's a lot of people that I know and have known for years that just refuse to be recorded in any kind of way. Yep. But they will sit down and, and chat with me through yeah. email or DMs. And that allows us to keep putting out content and connecting with people, doing shows, recording them. Because like sitting down to, to record with Big of a Vanity set, Com Trues, myself, and Kyle takes an extreme amount of coordination of time. Absolutely. And you've got Com Trues who could just basically say whatever the fuck he wants to say, and then we gotta figure it out. So, you know, that's that's hard to do. And yeah. I think we've done I don't think we need to like put out an episode every week or every two weeks or even once a month necessarily. I think we've done what we needed to do as far as that goes. So we just want to make them like exciting for us and continue Absolutely. down that road. And, and I'll do the written content and we'll see where that leads. People are really have responded well to what I'm doing uh, via the, the written stuff. Yep. So we'll see what that, what that does. And, I don't know. It, I leave possibilities uh, room open to many ideas, but I, I think us recording all the time is going to come down to maybe once a month and do more written stuff, save the, the recorded episodes for things that are maybe bigger or whatever, you know, things that will make a splash. Right. And, uh, and just kind of go that route and see what happens. At the end of the day, we, we have to want to do it. Kyle doesn't want to do it, and I don't want to do it, then there's no point in doing it at all. Absolutely. We're busy boys, but this guy's a lot busier. He's even more busier. Yeah. I got a lot more stuff going on in my life. So I'm just trying to find that balance, and I feel, I feel like we're approaching... I feel like now we're finally approaching the balance of, like, Kyle feels good about what we're doing and the pace of how we're doing it, I'm feeling good about what I'm doing and how I'm contributing. You know, because it's about the music. At the end of the day, all of this is about the love of of what we do in the music and how Absolutely. we contribute to that. It's not about my ego or Kyle's ego or us trying to get such and such artists. All mm. of those things are are not because we we're bugging the shit out of people. It was because they happened because of the work and the things that we did. And they were a consequence of just who we were. Um, so that's how we land calm truths. It's not because we have some special connection, but we are always just very sincere in our approach and what we do. And I think we're, we're at that point of a good balance of, of contributing back to electronic music in a way that is more consistent. Cause I could, it turns out I could d like pump out written articles really quick, yeah. which is really surprising because I hate, I was a music journalist in the early two thousands. Um, and I hate doing written interviews. I hate writing. It's the reason why I started podcasting as opposed to another website. Cause I hate writing. I hate it. Um, but I found a way to do it where it's not so painful and that I could do it pretty quick. And that's really everything that we do is out of laziness. It's how do we <laughs> how do we make it as easy for the person to come on? How do we make it as easy for myself and then and still put it out there and not be a total train wreck? And that's it. That's what it comes down to. It's a lot of work, man. All of this stuff. Podcasting, yeah. even just I've heard you guys talk about finding new music before, everything. Everything you guys are doing is a lot of work that shouldn't be minimized. And making things easier for yourselves just makes it so you can continue to do this at a sustainable level. And exactly. Like Kyle said, you're new you both of you are doing a lot with Nitro Wave, with Cryptogem, with the Paradise Arcade. You guys are putting a lot of yourselves into these different avenues. Yeah. Making it as easy as possible just allows you to do it for the most amount of time that you can. Yeah. And I, I have a lot of ideas and I'm not really going to like, because like, and Kyle knows, I'll, I'll propose like 80 ideas and 79 of them are shit. And <laughs> like the one idea sticks and we, we try it or experiment out. You know, I always have a lot of things going on and 
experiment. So there's, you know, I have ideas for the website and, and how to, again, how do I service the community more and feel in a way that feels meaningful and not just adding to like noise and garbage? Absolutely. Um, how do I do it in a way that's not negative and I don't want to contribute in a negative sort of way um, to things. And so, yeah, I've got, I've got lots of ideas and we have a lot. I mean, we've been around long enough. We, we have options. Yeah. So I don't know what those all are, but we'll see. It's exciting. I'm still excited. That's at the end of the day, I'm excited to do what we're doing and the things that it allows us to do. So as long as I have that feeling, I'll keep doing it. You said it to me before, and you said to lean into what feels good. And that's some of yeah. the best advice that anyone's ever given me. And something that I always say personally is to do it for the love of it. And as soon as you mm -hmm. don't enjoy doing what you're doing, then you shouldn't be doing it anymore. And um, that's it. It's a riff off of a saying that Kyle does. Say, oh, Kyle wait, say. wait, what's the one Kyle says? Fuck, I know this, dude. I know this. It Kyle, says, go ahead, say it. Yeah, you what? say it. Hold on. Okay. I, you say it. You say it. I want you to say it. All right. You do what you want to do, and you don't do what you don't want to do. <laughs> That's fucking sage wisdom. advice, man. That is wisdom. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing when that like you know like yourself that starting this thing is there's so many I've gotten unfortunately so much unsolicited advice from folks that have it's really pissed me off, you know because like it's number one it's like who are you to tell me anything, right. Or, or that's not what I'm trying to do, or it's just, it doesn't go well. And I think, you know, I look at Paradise Arcade and I go, there's already a lot of shows. Like, if you notice, we don't have certain kinds of guests on yep. because they're on every other platform. They're on every other show. What right. can we do that is going to contribute to any furthering of music or them or like if, if it's not gonna it's not right. gonna have a positive contribution or be interesting why do it so we don't have certain guests that we could have on that we're just not because i can't figure out a way that it would be positive for anybody i don't want to be another person that chases the same guest yeah and they've been on every single show what's the point i don't that doesn't matter you know have the same questions and the same answers i totally and get all that and for me, something that I always do is when I have a guest on, I will listen to every single interview they have ever done and I will write down the questions and the answers so I make sure that what I'm doing is not asking the same shit that can be found elsewhere. That's the last thing that I want to do is have something that you can go somewhere else and find and I don't I don't want that. I don't want to just be regurgitating the same information. Yeah. So I really stand by like what we've done with like Seth and the last two things that he's been on. No one else has done it. No one else has done that kind of content yeah. um, with him or any of the artists that we do. It's, it's unique. It's special. It's you gain a, a very specific, unique insight versus anything else. Absolutely. So that's part of it. And or just having fun. Have like a normal conversation. Have a normal yeah. conversation person. When we had Ghost on, I thought I had so much fun with Ghost because, you know, he had... But at that time, such a specific public persona and for him to come on and get drunk with us and bullshit and just talk nonsense was like the, a great feeling. And then, like, obviously, from that point, you, he's much more open about the kind of person that he is, as opposed to being a persona, the ghost yeah. skull mask persona where you're like, oh, this is a normal dude, not a not this caricature of a of a thing, an artist yeah. moniker. And that's something that I've always really enjoyed about your guys' show is you portray people as the people that they are and not the personas. Yeah. You have real conversations, and that's something that I've always strived to do as well is having genuine interactions, real conversations with people where you get to know the person for who they are and not just the music that they are. You know, So often we just hear a persona or hear the music and we don't think much outside of that. And then when you actually get to identify with that person and hear who they are as a person, what they like and what makes them tick, it makes you identify with them on this whole other level. And I've always really appreciated that about your guys' show. Yeah. I, yeah. And I say on the, on the other end of the spectrum on that too, if somebody 
doesn't want to, you know, talk about their personal life or anything, if they want to remain the persona, we respect that 100% too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We've definitely had some more guarded uh, people on who are much more protective of their their inner landscape, if you will, and we've been able to work with it. I just think our particular dynamic is well suited to kind of whatever that person is trying to do and respect it. And we could go either very insightful or really silly and have that balance of, of things. And it works. It's worked out really well for us. So totally. Well, I love everything you guys have been doing. I'm super stoked Thank that you. you guys have taken the time in your busy lives to come on my little show and, and hang out with me and shoot the shit. It's been a lot of fun. Of course. Um, it's nice to be on this end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the one being interviewed. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm happy to hear that, man. I just, I, it's been a trip for me because I listen to your guys' show. So I hear your voices. So there's been a couple times when I've been listening to you talk and I've just kind of been like, am I listening to an episode? You know, I'm just kind of like <laughs> thinking I'm listening to your guys' show right now. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, I'm, I need to be fucking engaging right now. This is, uh, this is not your show. <laughs> Let us soothe you into a trance, comforted. Absolutely. You got, that, you got that radio voice, man. You were previously in radio. Yeah, I had to work at it. It was something that I was actually trained to do. Really? Very interesting. There's a very specific radio cadence that you learn to do. Do you know... Um, <laughs> sorry. Go, go, go ahead. Go. No, I was just going to say, there's some people that I hear on the radio that have the worst absolute cadence that I've ever heard. And it's the ones that talk in this cadence like that. And it's news reporting. It's not radio. When they're like, oh, sure. Um, this event happened in Vancouver. And my name is blah, blah, blah. You know, oh, that cadence kills me, Le dude. All right. Let's talk about some radio stuff real quick before we head off into the, yeah. into the world. Cause I don't think you've ever heard me talk about this shit. Have no, you? no. Oh, All shit. Right, so All right. Yeah. Break it down, man. There's a couple of things uh, in radio. So. That particular affect, that inflection of the voice, um, it is when you hear it, they train you that basically they say you need to sound like you're 30 years old. So there is a very clear inflection in your voice to sound as neutral as possible. Because when you're conveying, it's not appropriate to convey a tragedy in a cheerful voice, right? Yeah, fair. So if you, so those kinds of news reporting, there's a very specific gains that you have to come across. Otherwise, you sound like a fucking psycho. Yeah. <laughs> right? You have to be very careful with that. There's another thing in radio, and it's a very, it's a specific radio term called puking. And pukers on the radio are like, hey, what I, da, 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 and they, they overforce their diaphragm when they speak. So right. it, it doesn't sound natural. It doesn't resonate. It sounds... Yeah. It, it it's like they're puking their voice out is where it comes from. Right. So it's a balance of speaking from your diaphragm, speaking from the bass, so that you project your voice because a certain timber hits more consistently through different, um, if you've got like a mono shitty system in a car, right? It doesn't have these banging systems. There's a certain voice cadence that carries across more consistently across all types of receivers if you will right so yep. you speak a particular way so you're able to resonate and people can hear you that makes sense so i had a vocal coach when i was in radio that helped me develop my what you hear today and and it just you do it so often that it becomes sort of your natural voice so this is how i talk all the time i was just gonna ask so, so do you not speak like this regularly are you no, using your radio normal. voice <laughs> At this point, this is my normal voice. He's, you just he's like swapped in his radio voice. Yeah, you just swapped just to this natural. different voice. It's completely yeah, it, different right now. I mean, my voice was never that different. It, it'd be this is my yeah. natural timber and everything else, but just how I, I always speak from my diaphragm now, as opposed to speaking like higher up in in the my nasal passages or whatever. Because you could talk from your diaphragm, you can talk from your your sinuses. So you've got like a more of a nasally voice. Like there's all these ways and you can control it. That's just like a singer right. yep. can control where they sing. A presenter controls her voice or an actor or those other kinds of folks. So uh, what you're basically telling me right now is I need to get a vocal coach and make sure that I'm hitting the right registers to fucking maximize output through car speakers. 
I mean, if that you, know, you do what you want to do and no, don't do what you don't want to do. Honestly, though, I don't. haven't done any of these things. I don't Kyle <laughs> naturally has it. <laughs> yeah, you do. You have, you, a, have do shit. you guys both have good voices to to be on podcasts and stuff. How's my radio voice? Is it okay? You, I, you, you, cut got, clear. you got a good one. Yeah, you yeah, cut it's clear. Okay. It's, all, it's all right. That's the point. That's what you, uh, able, you know what? You After hearing what Kyle has said about how fucking like abrupt he is, I take that as a very large compliment. <laughs> It's, you know, I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And you're not necessarily going to get a very articulate answer in one way or another. Yeah. It's just going to be one way or the other. That's Is it. it yes or no? That's all I need. That's all I need. That's good. You, you run a real professional racket here. Yeah. <laughs> real, real tight ship. <laughs> okay, let everyone know where they can find you guys. Well, shit, we're pretty much everywhere. So uh, we've got our website, which is the paradisearcade.com. Not paradisearcadeshop.com that's not it Fuck the paradisearcade.com you're going to find us on twitter and instagram our platform streams everywhere except for stitcher so if it's itunes or amazon or audible or or pandora or whatever you use it's going to you're going to be able to find it listen to it cuz we got hot shit hell yeah listen to it rate it follow you it read it no you could read it now. Um, I'm read it starting as well. to do the, the, the written articles. I've p- toyed with, and I quickly decided against it. I was thinking about converting some of the episodes into strictly di- uh, like written, but because of how we are, what we do, it would just be total fucking anarchy. And I was oh, like, yeah. I, I'm Dude, not that, doing that. That would not be a good idea. Just you, There's probably an AI that would do that for you. And it would probably actually be really funny to read the absolute topic shift from one thing to another. You there do- is a, um, there's a few programs that you could, or a service that you could pay to have your vocal things converted. Right. Um, I am refuse to spend the money on that. Mm. So I'm not going to do that. Fair. But there's there were some people working with me to figure out how to bootleg do that idea. And then I quickly am like, you know what? The, what we do, it just I'm just going to leave it. At, it. That's that experience. This is the other experience. Yeah. And we'll totally. just keep them separate. So head to the paradise arcade dot com. Check out the written articles. Check out the podcast everywhere. You can check out podcasts. And make yeah. sure you rate, follow, listen to them. All that shit. These guys are fucking doing awesome stuff. Buy the records. Cryptogem. You guys have a record company. Yeah. Go to you the events it. if you're in the Twin Cities. Nitro Wave TC. <laughs> Do all the shit. Support us in every way possible. Support them the all over the place. Minneapolis, hey, St. Paul area. We do have yeah. a Patreon test. I was just going to say, you guys are on Patreon. So if people want to Thank you for being a contributor. Regard, of course, man. I'm, I'm a big fan of you guys, and it's been a pleasure having you on. So, like I said, I appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks, man. Thank you. Well, hold on a second there, friend. Before you skedaddle on out of here, make sure you do yourself a favor and go and follow the Paradise Arcade, Nitro Wave TC, Cryptogem, and all of those locations listed in the description. Thank you again. Kyle and Eric for coming on. I hope you all enjoy the episode. Be well.